Right, should we make a start? Are you happy, John? Yeah. Yeah? Okay, fantastic. So welcome everybody um, to this Society and Ethics Research Group seminar. So we're a group based at the Welcome Genome Campus in Cambridge. For those of you who aren't from our campus, um, we're a group of social scientists uh, with a mixture of skills, so sociology, genetic counselling, uh, anthropology, filmmaking, statistics, uh, I think that's covered everybody, and uh, our role is to explore um, the societal impact of genomics on publics and patients, um, and we work amongst and with and next to the scientists at the Sanger Institute, and we're part of a group called Connecting Science. Um, and so John Roberts is going to be giving the seminar today, and John is a very experienced genetic counsellor, so that means he works in the NHS with families who are grappling with making sense of genetic information in a family, genetic testing, the meaning of, of uh, things being inherited. So he's very used to having conversations about complex science with people who know very little about the science, so he helps them make sense of it. Um, so as a registered genetic counsellor, that's what John does for some of the week and then the rest of the week he works with us at the Society and Ethics Research Group and um, he did his PhD with us um, and also at UCL um, with Professor Louise Archer and his expertise is on um, science communication and some of the sociological theories that underpin science communication and so that's what he's going to be focusing on in this seminar. So I'll hand over to John. What, what we wanted to do is, um, if you've got any questions as John's talking, that's fantastic and you really welcome that. And we'd love you to put those into the Q&A box um, on the side of the screen. Um, and then I'll collate all of those and then put those to John at the end. And hope, hopefully that will work for the Q&A at the end. So handing over to John now. Thanks, John. Thanks, Anna. Um, so is everything working? Yes. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, the title of my um, seminar is Problematic Concepts in Science Communication. And you know, to start with, I think it's worth noting that, you know, science communication itself is a problematic concept in that it's defined in lots of different ways. Um, so, um, you know, before we start, one of the things I'll say is that I'm using a very broad term in terms of science communication to refer to any form of science engagement, science communication, public understanding of science, as opposed to the kind of the more narrow term in which science communication is sometimes used. Um, for the um, kind of opening slide, just to talk a bit about the campus um, where um, I'm kind of based for some of the week. Um, so there's different mission statements here, um, partly to do with the Welcome Genome Campus or the Sanger Institute and Connecting Science, which is the larger group that society and ethics is um, sort of under the umbrella of. Um, and each of these in a more or less direct way does require us to uh, engage with non-scientists in the wider public. Um, so kind of one of the perspectives that I'm kind of coming at this from, you know, I'm not sure kind of the attendees, but um, from sort of science communicators to people in public engagement right through to people who work either in, in healthcare or, or science labs, um, in some shape or form, you sort of will be expected to engage with scientists and, and kind of the wider public. Um, so there's a campus perspective. Um, there's also a kind of current perspective where a lot of these terms, so deficit dialogue and expert, um, uh, each of these terms is in some way contested at the minute. Um, in particular, I think, you know, the concept of expert the famous quote now from Michael Gove, where Britain's had enough of experts and the role of expertise in the COVID-19 response. Um, so, you know, each of these terms is um, very live in terms of kind of how it's been actively defined um, and, and the meanings that we take from those. Um, I think I'm going to start though with a historical perspective. Um, this is um, partly just to avoid what um, the sociologist Jim Fowles calls um, chronocentrism. Just this essential sort of belief that you know our our own times are paramount. Um, Philip Sargent perhaps is a bit more pithy when he calls it the narcissism of the present. Um, and I think it's a useful perspective to start with. Um, it also slightly gets me off the hook in that this is quite a long-standing issue. So I'm kind of going to avoid um, any kind of easy answers. Um, um, so if we start with um, this, so if we go back to 1830 and uh, Charles Babbage. Um, 
is writing here about reflections on the decline of science in England. And Babbage was concerned, as the book would suggest, about the decline of science. And um, what he wanted to do, and what his colleagues, a number of his colleagues wanted to do, was increase the professionalization of science. Um, and they wanted to increase the role of science in terms of um, its role in government and um, the role of science as a profession. And um, it was um, strongly felt that one of the ways to do this was to engage in what we might now call science communication. So it's to increase the um, perception and the attitudes and knowledge of science amongst the public. Um, and um, in response to this in 1831, you get the association, the British Association for the Advancements of Science formed. Um, and about two years later, um, William Huell coins the term scientist to refer to this um, emerging professional group. But I you know, wanted to put this in um, partly to show that you know, right from the outset that when the term scientist is being coined, the relationship between science and the public is central to this. Um, and also, I think what it shows as well is that from the outset, you can't divorce science communication from wider political and cultural situations. So um, the uh, situation at this time, of course, we're only 30 years after the French Revolution. Um, and what Charles Babbage is arguing is that we need to move away from sort of aristocratic men of science towards a more professional group. Um, and of course, only, you know, 30 years earlier, you have the French Revolution, where um, Anton Lavoisier, who was the, um, you know, father of modern chemistry, but also an aristocrat, lost his head in the guillotine. Um, and Charles Babbage was arguing that we need to be more like France, um, who had a more kind of professionalised scientific institution at the time. But it's impossible to separate that argument from the, you know, um, you know, political and cultural situation that's happening at the time. Um, we can then move on, you know, a few years, about 30 years, and you get Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species. Um, and again, we see more boundary work here being performed. So Darwin's work was uh, perceived to be a challenge to religious authority. Um, and the relationship between um, evolution and religion is, is a complicated one. I'm probably worthy of a seminar in its own right. Um, I think for our purposes here, the main thing I want to note is how these boundaries of, of authority were being negotiated. And primarily there was um, you know, a huge amount of public addresses and public lectures. And these were a significant way with which scientists sought to impose their authority, particularly their authority over religion. So again, this is um, boundary work that's being done in terms of scientific authority and scientific truth. And this has been done through um, you know, public communication and public science communication. Um, we then get um, two really interesting periods that I'm just going to have to skip over, which is the kind of into, you know, the, the, the two world wars, which again sees some very interesting relationships emerge between science and the public. But I'm going to skip ahead quite a lot to 1957 and the launch of Sputnik. Um, again, we see the relationship between science and the public undergoing some really interesting changes. Um, so uh, the, the um, Sputnik was the Soviet satellite and saw the Soviets take the um, lead in the space race. Uh, and this leads to a huge amount, amount of anxiety in America about kind of the decline of science, the decline of scientific prominence. Um, and in a move that's relatively similar to Babbage about 150 years earlier, the, the solution is, is to be seen as science communication. And it's at this time you get the coining of the term scientific literacy. Um, this idea that you know, we need to measure scientific literacy and improve people's knowledge, both in schools and in, in general. Um, we can go forward to 1985. So in the UK, um, the Royal Society produce um, this um, uh, report called the Bodmer Report that coins this term or popularizes the term the public understanding of science. And again, um, it's seen uh, to be at a time of declining influence in science. Science is um, seen to be in a bit of a crisis point at this point, so it declined throughout the 1970s, and that was the perception. And the solution, again, is to increase the public understanding of science. Um, so, you know, the Bodmer Report makes a familiar diagnosis, which is a lack of public knowledge. Um, and this leads to a, a sort of an expansion in these kind of activities broadly encapsulated under the public understanding of science. We then go forward to 2000 and the House of Lords Select Committee produces um, a report. Uh, and we see now a quite a radical shift in tone from um, deficit models to 
a model that um, could be broadly thought of something like science and society um, and what we then get to think of as what we call the dialogue model. Um, so this is a different way of thinking that the kind of diagram kind of encapsulates and instead of this kind of linear transfer of knowledge from the scientist to the public you get this idea that it's more um, sort of uh, involved in a kind of a network and actually different groups with different points of view need to be listening to each other and engaging in these dialogues. So governments and public and experts and trade and industry all need to be talking to each other and science communication is much more of this kind of systemic um, kind of activity. Um, and this broadly speaking is sort of um, where we're at at the present day. So this kind of view of science communication that we see from 2000 onward, at least in the rhetoric is considered one of the, the preferred method of science communication, this kind of dialogue model. Um, and I think one of the key aspects of the dialogue model is that you take non-experts or, or so-called lay views seriously. Um, despite this being almost 20 years ago, um, it's um, been noted by a number of scholars that deficits though still persist. Um, so dialogue is often very much embraced in terms of the rhetoric, but actually it's quite hard to, um, you know, be free of deficits and it's a very adhesive idea you know this is a paper from 2019 you know this you know we're still debating um how do we move away from this kind of deficit thinking um and i think this does make sense um in terms of um you know science communication and what we think of as scientific knowledge um and you know, we can see this in the fact that, um, you know, the definition of dialogue has, has been pretty diffuse. So, you know, a key aspect of the dialogue model is that you take lay views seriously. But how do you do that? Um, so in 2003, there was um, something called uh, the GM Nation, which is, which is a, a UK based um, sort of government led public debate about the use of genetically modified foods in the United Kingdom. Um, and it was you know, three years after the report from the House of Lords and the aim was really to embrace this dialogue model of science communication and involve the public in this kind of quite controversial science. Um, but the GM nation amongst you know, um, some has been criticized for essentially being too little too late. So yes, they brought in the public, but was this anything more than just consensus forming? Because the scientists already made the decisions about what the science was and where the science should be going. And actually, when you get to this level of, was it public debate or was it just PR? Was it about getting people on board where the scientists already felt we should be going? And in response to this, um, there was a call for more, what we call, might call upstream engagement. But that again is, is difficult, you know, then it raises interesting questions of how far do we let the public set the agenda in terms of, you know, what science should be researched um, and in this place well what's the role of expertise and I think where you stand on this does depend a little bit on where you stand on the nature of scientific truth um, so you know essentially where do you see that boundary between scientific knowledge and everyday knowledge between an expert and a layperson and in recent times a lot of sociology work has shown that actually a lot of these boundaries are perhaps more fuzzy than um, had been previously assumed in the deficit model. Um, from my point of view, I think we still, you know, um, need to understand that there is such a thing as scientific truth. Now I do that with kind of a, a philosophy of science degree where I, I'm aware that um, science is contingent, it's uncertain, and science is impossible to separate from culture. But I do think we need to still be able to say that scientific truth is exists and is important for example we need to be able to say that climate change is real and we need to be able to say that vaccines are safe and we need to be able to say that wearing a mask is important for reducing the transmission of covid and we need to you know have a place for the scientific truth in the public science communication so then the question remains if you accept that science has a right to make unique claims about truth in the world how do you do science communication without deficits? And this is quite a hard circle to square if you are committed to a dialogue model of science communication. So we need a space for scientific truth. 
So, you know, it's just tempting to go, well, well, can't we just tell people the facts? That just seems like a more sensible thing to be doing. Can't we just demonstrate to people that climate change is real? Can't we just prove to people the vaccines are safe? Can't we just show people that masks reduce transmissions of COVID? Um, well, to some extent, yes. I mean, popularization is a fine and valid way of doing things. And I think, you know, lots of people enjoy you know, popularization of science that communicates scientific facts in a very engaging manner. And there's nothing wrong with that. However, models that rely on this kind of deficit approach, that they're, they're not good at changing people's minds and they're not very good at engaging broader audiences. And this is because science, well, um, is also, you know, a way of understanding the world. It's also a form of culture. Um, so, um, you know, when we see people with views that we might think are um, non-scientific, it is very tempting to kind of bombard people with the facts and slip back into this deficit model. Um, but I think the key thing from a science point of view is that science communication should be evidence-based. And the evidence suggests quite strongly that those deficit models don't work. So first we see you know, the implicit assumption with deficit models that more knowledge is going to lead to better attitudes. But this is at best an ambiguous relationship. And actually there is um, research that shows with controversial science, more knowledge can often lead to an increased polarization of views. But secondly, science works as a form of culture and that matters in terms of understanding why deficits don't work. Um, what I'm gonna do is uh, one of, one of the, the um, new ways that we can talk about science as culture is to build on uh, an idea called science capital. Um, but before that, science capital builds on the work of a French sociologist called Bourdieu. And um, Bourdieu was very interested in the way that um, uh, power and privilege is maintained within cultures. And in particular, he was interested in how culture works as a form of power and how culture can confer social status and how sort of culture can be um, used in a kind of an exchange network to, to, to um, be seen as a valuable form of, of knowledge. And in particular, he was interested in the arbitrary value that we give to culture. Why is some culture seen as dumb and one, some culture seen as smart? What, what, you know, what, why is this and, and, and how does that work in, in our society? So I'll show this as an example the quote from Stephen Fry from a recent interview where he, he's um, frustrated with the fact that people don't go and see, you know, people go and see superhero movies. So, so he says, you know, don't go and see superheroes hitting each other. That's for children. You know, this is, this is, this is infantile culture. Yet in the same interview, he's promoting this book, which is a book about Greek mythology. Now, Greek mythology has a lot of magical and super powered beings squabbling and hitting each other. So why is Greek mythology considered to be an intelligent book and why does knowing about Greek mythology make you seem smart when watching superheroes makes you seem infantile and Bourdieu draws your attention to the fact that this value we give to culture is arbitrary there's no inherent value to Greek mythology that makes it smarter than superhero films this is something that um, uh, we um, give to culture but not just as an arbitrary value, but a hidden value. So the way it works as a form of power is you're not meant to see it. So that's why, um, you know, it feels like Greek mythology is more intelligent than superhero films um, because the arbitrary value of that is hidden. As soon as you see the arbitrary value, you see there's no distinction at all. So Borgia draws our attention to this way that kind of culture works in our society and why certain forms are valued over others and how those um, make culture feel like it is for some people and not for other people. Um, and this idea has then been um, uh, kind of um, uh, widened to um, think about, you know, science as a form of, um, a form of culture, uh, and particularly with this idea of science capital, um, which um, kind of uses this kind of Bourdieusian way of thinking about um, different forms of capitals to you know, think about how, how can we think about how science works in our society. Um, and I think what it is particularly useful in doing um, is understanding how 
sciences culture means that deficit models are not going to work because um, we can use that say with an example of another elite form of um, culture if we think about say um, opera you know opera like many forms of culture is considered quite elite um, and also does have a big diversity problem now if i was to tell you that i was going to try and widen participation in opera my plan for this was to go to a council estate and explain to them all their misconceptions about opera, why they're wrong, and I'll educate them about opera, and once they're better educated about opera, they'll love it. Problem solved. You can instantly see that this is simply going to be an ineffectual way of doing it, and the same is true about science. You know, it's a form of elite culture that some people have felt is for them, some people feel is really not for them, um, and that's nothing to do with their knowledge of it, it's nothing to do with knowing enough. It's about how culture works in our society and the way that we see some culture is for us and some culture is not for us. And this idea um, of science capital, um, amongst other things, is very useful for helping you understand how people can feel excluded from science. It has nothing to do with knowing enough about it or not. So I think it's, it's a, a, a useful lens for us to sort of think through and remind ourselves why deficit models are, are not particularly good, especially if you're either trying to change people's mind or engage people who may have felt excluded from science. Um, and, um, you know, it is um, a widely used concept now, science capital, but the, the um, Science Museum in London uses it to frame their engagement activities and the latest um, 2020 government report and the public attitudes towards science yeah, draws on science capital as well. Um, but I think it's not completely without its problems. Um, and I think one problem is that um, uh, Borgia was a cynic. So while I think it's really important to understand the arbitrary value of culture, it's also important to understand that culture is genuinely meaningful for people. People do engage with certain forms of culture because they are considered elite and they know that, that they are somehow valuable. But they also engage with culture because they like it. It's interesting, it's meaningful, it's enjoyable. And there's very little room in a Borgesian slash science capital analysis, I think, to really start to get to grips with that. But I think a, a, a slightly bigger problem is that it can be possible to slip back into deficit theory deficit theorizing when you when you're in a science capital sort of um, model so this is taken from the introduction to the latest government 2020 public attitudes towards science i just highlighted a few important bits so they talk about um, building and enhancing science capital and increasing science capital so again we're in this sort of phase where there's something that people lack and then we need to be making sure that you know we we um you know uh need to uh, essentially you know go and um, enhance them, which, which is not necessarily a bad thing but again it, it we're slipping into a, a, a deficit way of thinking and i think we see this really in the way that you know the in the concept of science capital one of the key factors is talking about science in everyday life which is fine that is you know an important part of how we might think of science capital but um when um, I did some of my research and I looked at people who had particularly felt that science was not really something for them. What I found was they were having lots of conversations about things where, you know, mine was in related, you know, specifically focused on genetics because of, um, you know, my research interest and my background. And I was looking at the way that people talked about genetics and, and genomics and people were having lots of conversations about how things are inherited within their family. Um, and these things really spark people's interest in terms of both both in terms of health and in terms of just other personality traits. Um, and these were everyday conversations about something for which, you know, genetics was um, in a really important part of it. But they would not have framed it as having a conversation about science in everyday life. So I think it's important that we don't say, you know, we need to build your science capital, which means having, you know, conversations about science in everyday life we're then essentially saying you know your those conversations are wrong you need to be having the conversations more like us which again is not going to be engaging wider audiences so i think this, it's a really useful uh, tool um, to think about how science works and how we can do science engagement but i think um uh, it doesn't quite 
take us out of the deficit model to the extent that that I I, I think um, you know uh, would be really useful. What I think you can do with science capital is um, use it in conjunction with a theory um, called funds of knowledge. Um, so funds of knowledge was um, uh, primarily developed kind of at the end of the 20th century in uh, academics and researchers who are working on schools in the borderlands between the USA and Mexico. And um, there was this persistent education gap between Mexican children and their peers um, and interventions that had focused on remedying these perceived educational deficits uh, had not been successful. Um, and some educators worked with some anthropologists um, and they went into the homes of, um, of um, Mexican families and the aim was to find out what they're good at, what they know about, what they feel confident with, um, what they term their funds of knowledge. Um, and then the aim was to bring these into the classroom to improve the educational experience for these children. And I think a funds of knowledge um, approach genuinely allows you to move outside of deficits. Um, so um, some of these researchers um, uh, you know, some of the kind of pioneering research this quote is taken from one of their papers. It says, um, the concept of funds of knowledge is based on a simple premise. People are competent and have knowledge and their life experiences has given them that knowledge. And I think one, one of the key things about the kind of funds of knowledge approach is that it, it sees um, a difference between academic and everyday forms of knowledge, but it genuinely respects those everyday forms of knowledge. And I think this was encapsulated by a slightly random quote, but one I quite like from the historian of science, Simon Schaffer, who's talking about science and science engagement. He's asked the question, he says, do you think there's um, something of what scientists do that lay people cannot understand? He says, no, if you think for a moment about Hollywood expects of its audience to be able to follow, nothing that citizens need to understand about the workings of science is as complicated as that. There's nothing to say on this topic that is narratively as complicated as the Matrix 3. So no, I think it's this idea that people go about their lives and their lives are complicated and they develop these, you know, um, these funds of knowledge throughout their life. And while they may be different to scientific expertise, they are still incredibly complex and to be respected and are huge resources that we can draw. Um, but I do think still with the fund of knowledge, you do have a problem of you haven't quite yet squared that circle. So while I think funds of knowledge are an incredibly valuable tool, um, a uh, argument could be put forward, but what about this idea of scientific truth? So yes, funds of knowledge are um, meaningful and legitimate and represent the complicated ways that people have come to understand the world through their own experiences but what happens if people still have a misunderstanding about science you still have to find a way of respecting that scientific expertise and how do you do that without just saying no you've got it wrong because we know that that essentially just is an ineffective communication strategy so the question then is how do you bring those funds of knowledge into science communication activities in a meaningful way. Another way of framing that could be essentially how do you operationalize the dialogue model of science communication, which is sort of what, what I'm driving at. And one idea is this idea of hybrid or third space. Um, so scholarship has often used this kind of idea of hybrid space in conjunction with kind of fund of knowledge research. And the idea is that um, this form of research acknowledges both expertise um, in terms of you know, so scientific expertise or academic expertise and the varied ways that people make sense of the world from their everyday lives. So it's an idea of a space that brings together these different discourses from different communities and blends them together. And it's through those, a meeting of those different understandings that new, new understandings kind of emerge. So I think the kind of key thing from a hybrid space is that it allows um, a sharing of power. So um, it allows those different viewpoints to come together. It allows you to, to distinguish between the different viewpoints and to make distinctions between you know, expertise and lay points of view. But it, the, aim, the aim is for um, a new understanding to emerge on both sides when those different viewpoints come together. And um, part of that is about you know, 
um, thinking about issues about power. So you might think about this, you know, from a, uh, a clinical viewpoint from my work in genetic counselling. You know that um, the way that a, a clinic room is set up hugely shapes which views are then going to be seen as legitimate in that space. And the same, a lot of this research comes from student education and they talk about the way that the classrooms are set up in terms of allowing different voices to be heard in terms of particularly how allowing those, those children's funds of knowledge to kind of enter the classroom. Um, it also commits you to, um, you know, creating kind of new understandings. Um, so as an example from, again, from a kind of clinical point of view, um, you might have um, a patient who comes in who has a um, uh, understanding about how something is inherited. We might term that kind of fund of knowledge, which is based on the kind of um, ideas about um, their kind of family history and how things um, have been inherited. So often you might hear patients say in a genetic counselling consultation, oh, you know, you know, I've come for the genetic test, but, you know, it's from my mum's side and I, I really take after the, my dad's side of the family. So I don't think I've inherited it. Now, of course, you know, from a genetic counselling point of view, you might then be thinking, well, actually, that doesn't chime at all with my view of Mendelian inheritance. So if I was thinking from a deficit point of view, I would then explain to them Mendelian inheritance. But actually, what I haven't done there, you know, is um, understand what that um, result is going to mean for them. So, you know, I haven't gained any new knowledge there as a genetic counsellor. So I can still explain and talk about Mendelian inheritance, but at the same time, not to dismiss or to un underplay the significance of the way that that patient is understanding their own family history. And actually the meaning of that result is gonna depend on that because if they, they say have inherited the uh, you know, gene alteration uh, and they're not expecting it, that surprise or the emotions they would feel would only make sense if I've understood their explanation of their family history. So um, you know, this, this kind of idea of hybrid space um, requires a kind of uh, uh, a distinction between viewpoints, but it doesn't necessarily put those viewpoints in a hierarchy. And I think it also sees um, the tensions between those different viewpoints, viewpoints as opportunities for new understandings to emerge. Um, so I think it's quite a challenging way of thinking about science communication, but I think one that has a huge amount of potential. Um, but I do think it's harder than ever because um, I think it's um, increasingly, as, as we you know, um, saw in our um, historical examples, very hard to divorce science communication from the, the broader you know, um, political and cultural situation. So, you know, it's, it's how we see it today. It's hard to divorce science communication from, um, you know, concept of expertise from things like Brexit and COVID, in and um, you know, um, broader kind of political arguments. Um, and as it becomes increasingly polarized, it becomes harder, I think, to enter into those dialogues with people you disagree with. Um, and, and I don't think some of the ways that we have for um, you know engaging things like social media, they they don't often lend themselves to this way of um you know engaging with people who you disagree with um it tends to set itself up much more as a kind of combative way which actually is kind of the, the antithesis of what the hybrid space kind of viewpoint is um, so i think it's it's kind of more important than ever to kind of have this kind of view but actually i think it's more challenging than ever to do it um, so just as a quick summary um so you know um i think if you want to engage in kind of um, popularization of science I think that's very um, you know valid but if you want to change people's minds uh, you want to engage wider audiences I think the key thing is that deficits don't work um, and I think you know as science communicators we need to have an evidence-based practice and you know telling people they're wrong isn't going to work um, uh, I think the key thing as well is that you know science is culture and I think if we understand that, that really helps us understand how we can do science communication in a way that is effective. Um, and thinking about the hybrid third space, again, I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, this is a lot, you know, science communication is a very long standing issue and I'm not going to have solved it in a single seminar. And I think this idea of science capital, funds of knowledge, and then hybridity theory can provide a really useful framework for, you know, opera, opera, 
operationalizing the dialogue model. Um, I think the, the key um, you know, messages would be, you know, firstly, if you want to be heard, you have to listen. I think that's the key thing about hybrid space. If you want people to listen to you and take you seriously, you have to understand where they're coming from. And secondly, that you know, tension between different viewpoints doesn't have to be a battle, it can be an opportunity. Um, I think this is recorded. I put a few of the kind of key references up there so you can kind of go through um, and, and look at those if you would like. And then I think I'm going to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, John. That was absolutely lovely. Beautiful summary of the literature and, and why it's relevant and why we should be thinking about it. Um, so there's some lovely questions coming in. Um, I just wondered if you, before we get to those, um, could you say something about uh, what, what top tips would you be giving scientists? I'm just thinking at the Sanger Institute where, where we sit, uh, we have just under 2,000 scientists, who, many of whom do a lot of fantastic science communication about their research. Um, but what, what top tips would you be giving them for just tweaking how they're doing the delivery of that um, to bring in the, the hybrid model and the, more of the co-creation of a dialogue? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's um, for not being um, afraid of um, viewpoints that, um, you know, feel very challenging. Um, and I know this... Um, from kind of my clinical work um when somebody um you know um, says something that feels like it could directly contradicts they say medical explanation of genetics i have to fight my urge to immediately correct them so i know that urge. so you know you know i might be sitting with a patient and they um you know say something and that my, my first thought is well that's just wrong and you need to understand why the, the actual explanation um, and it, it, it's um, you know fighting that urge and I think that's where the kind of evidence base comes in because I you know it's useful for, to me to know that you know while that might be my first instinct I actually know it's going to be deeply ineffectual and I need to kind of empathize and understand where they're coming from so I think it's it's um, you know uh, when you're engaging with you know, audiences who might have different points of view, especially points of view you might think of as unscientific, is to learn how to kind of fight that urge, step back and engage with what that person's point of view is, um, because that is going to lead to a, I think, um, more uh, kind of beneficial engagement between the two different points of view. So you, you gave a lovely example yesterday when we were chatting. Um, so if you were um, talking with somebody who was refusing to wear a face mask because they didn't believe the science yeah um, can you can you just expand on that well yeah i was thinking you know we were chatting yesterday about you know um how frustrating it is when you see people who, who are doing things that seem just just un, deeply unscientific but i just don't think that you know um you know shouting at people who are not wearing face marks or why they're wrong is going to make any difference i think because the reasons that people are not wearing face marks are not because they um you need to understand the science better you know they they've already made up their minds um and we you know know that um you know huge amounts of the ways that we research on the internet you know just um confirms our biases um and you know a huge amount of sort of psychological mechanisms are going on which means that people are just going to be resistant to those facts so actually you need to understand you know okay these people are refusing to wear their mask why, why are they doing that what's there's there's some deep emotional reason that they they are they, and until we understand that um and how can you use the hybrid space to unpick that so i mean i suppose that would be the practical technique if you if you were wanting to change somebody's mind or yeah i think it's about it's about understanding um you know what what you know um what are those reasons you know for they're doing it and, and and entering into a space where i think you know, eventually, I think I think it's it's an extreme example, but a useful one to think through with the mass because it, the end point is that we want them to listen to a point of view which respects scientific expertise. But the challenge to that is that we need to at least understand where they're coming from, at least understand you know what are the reasons they're doing for what they're doing, um, which is it's hard to do. But I think you know um, it's only going to polarize. And as we saw um, before, you know the the link between knowledge. And polarized views often when there's polarized views 
on scientific questions more knowledge just leads to those views being polarized um, so i think it's about you know um, creating opportunities where people feel like they are going to um, you know be listened to and i think in the flip side of that is that they are more likely to then listen to different points of view themselves but it is challenging i think it's, it's not not an easy way around it yeah Fantastic. So I've got some lovely, lovely questions. So um, just to start, um, so how do you think science communication should change after COVID? And how do you think it will change? Um, I'm not sure how it will change. I think that um, it's going to be really interesting to see how um, everything, when all the dust settles, where people lay the blame for any perceived faults. Um, because I think there has been a kind of confluence between political and scientific decisions. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see where the broader public kind of perception lies in terms of the scientific kind of accountability or responsibility for those decisions. Um, how I think it should change, I do think that what we've seen in terms of the government's response and the scientific response to COVID, that so much of that has dependent on trust so i think one of the key issues for science communication going forward is that you know a, a focus needs to be on maintaining trust and i think there's a lot of good research that already understands how trust is you know um built and maintained with regards to scientific messages um but i think that's going to be really interesting going forward when we think of things like you know um adherence to recommendations is going to rely on a huge amount of trust in the scientific validity of, of different messages So thinking about the uptake of vaccine and the use of masks um, and I think we've seen some really good examples of that with things like you know the hand washing I think that was something where you know I think that was a clear message and I think a trustworthy message and I think kind of the importance of that I think has kind of penetrated so I think kind of going forwards I think one of the key things here is going to be trust but I think in terms of building trust one of those things is that you have to also listen to different points of view so you know um, and it's, you know, it's also about um, picking what makes people worthy of trust isn't it what, what does trustworthiness look like to people and how can how can we maintain that um, so okay um, there's people are asking to see the reference page again would you be able to just back yeah go back to the slides and just pop that up yeah and also can i ask one of our team could you put our website details in the q a so that um uh, anybody in the audience wants to look up the slides or see more about this work that they can do maybe lauren or emma could you pop that in that would be really really lovely um i think we have recorded this haven't we and so this will be available to share and to um, enjoy at another time um, but all the details will be on our website which is the society and ethics research website yeah. I've, I've put a kind of yeah a lot of the key ones I've used in the talk up but if anyone's interested and wants you know uh, a bigger sort of selection of references and any of the particular topics I've talked on they can always contact uh, contact me I'm happy to you know um, give any any additional references I've got and any of the particular you know topics I've touched on Fantastic. Okay, so we've got now a question from Elena. Culture also implies identification with not just accessibility too. Isn't knowledge and also very importantly choice crucial for involvement of people from different backgrounds and communities? Yeah, the issue of choice. Sorry, would you mind just repeating that question again? Well, I'm, I'm assuming this relates to choice, making choices about clinical decision making. That's where the... Uh, that's where I'm relating that to. So it's about culture also implies identification yeah. with not just accessibility to, I'm assuming, information. Isn't knowledge and also very importantly choice crucial for involvement of people from different backgrounds and communities? So I guess, yes, it's more than just having a conversation and listening to both sides. It's about the options that are available to people. Yeah. To take I think the point of culture and identity is really important as well. And I think that's where understanding science as culture is, is really valuable because, you know, um the one of the you know ways that we create our identity is through culture um but also one of the ways that we are excluded is through um culture particularly identities that are considered more or less welcome so i think um you know it's really important to the the idea of um identity and culture is um 
a really important one to, to kind of bring up because I think one of the things, again, this kind of idea of science capital and science and culture helps us kind of zone in on is, you know, why do people feel excluded from science? Um, and it's because of these ideas of culture and identity. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that diversity matters so much in science. You know, it was a kind of slightly a side point, but you know, it's, uh, the ideas of you know, diversity of views, I think, matter, um, both in terms of, I think, you know, if you have a diversity of views, you have a much better chance of arguing convincingly that you have something approaching scientific objectivity. So it's more likely that the science is not going to, you know, um, have the biases you know the, the kind of cultural biases that, that, that you know the, that we all have but also in terms of um you know thinking of science as something for me i think you know um diversity in science really matters in terms of making it feel like a a, a broader form of culture that is for everybody mm. and so we have a question here from john about he said he says i like the idea of a hybrid space but it depends on dialogue however non-scientists as well as scientists may take a very strong position and not be very open to listening. How do you recommend opening up dialogues? I mean, this is all about being vulnerable together, isn't it? And actually not sticking uh, completely yeah. to being right <laughs> and yeah. feeling that you have the power. This is about sharing power, isn't it? Yeah. So how would you recommend opening up the dialogue? I mean, I think, I think what, one thing in terms of persuading scientists is, um, you know, uh, talking about an evidence base. So I think, you know, one key thing is in terms of, yes, it's, um, you may encounter, I think, resistance from scientists in terms of this idea of, um, you know, uh, engaging in this kind of hybrid spaces or actually the, the power to say what is and isn't legitimate knowledge is considered much more shared. But actually, I think part of it is just showing that, you know, um, the evidence base and saying, actually, you know, if you are trying to engage people who are cynical about, cynical about the science and broaden your audiences, um, you, th this is one of the best ways of doing it. And, and I think, you know, opening up that kind of, um, you know, evidence base to kind of convince people of the, of the need for it. Um, but then I think there are other ways as well, I think, about creating, um, so didn't have a kind of time to necessarily go into it in this seminar, but um, uh, one of the ideas that I've kind of used in, in other bits of my work about hybrid spaces is, um, again, kind of a slightly different metaphor, but drawing on the ideas of creating habitable spaces. Um, so this is based from another French sociologist. Um, I, I do like other things other than French sociologists, but there's another French sociologist called Deserto, who um, was particularly interested in the way that people um, um, just kind of go about their everyday life um, and the ways that they essentially um, resist um, sort of impositions from um, kind of um, people who are kind of uh, in, in positions of power. And he, he looked at this through a huge kind of range of things from simple things like the ways that people design cities or people design a city in a particular way. But then when people actually use it, they create their own way of, um, you know, just navigating the city and using spaces. So, you know, city planners might put up a space to be used in one way, but when people actually use it, they, they, they um, use it in, in a way that perhaps was um, never intended by the people who designed it. Um, and he also extends this idea to things like pop culture. So he says, you know, people put, put culture out into the world or pop whether it's books or films or TV shows or whatever. But then people then use these in ways that you were never imagining. Um, they become what he calls these kind of habitable spaces and they become these sort of um, places where lots of different viewpoints can meet because you project your own ideas and your own thoughts and your own ideas onto the culture that you use so he says that you know culture itself the, the way you consume culture is in itself a creative act so you're not passive when you you're creative when you consume culture um and um uh you know, some uh, an example of some of my research is that um, I asked people to name me some films about genetics, um, and people told me about fantasy films like Game of Thrones, well, fantasy TV shows like Game of Thrones or Harry Potter. Now, these things are not about genetics, but people are using them to say yes. You know, these kind of this creative act of interpreting. Um, another example is um, from the film uh, The Matrix, where um, there's this idea of um, red and blue pills. And um, it's been appropriated, interestingly, by the kind of the alt right, um, uh, as this idea of you know, um, you know, if you take the red pill, then you you know, you still see the world as we do, and, and they kind of refer to the, this kind of bombarding people with right wing propaganda as being red pilled. Um, the 
you know, um, creators of the Matrix. Um, I don't think we'd ever have expected that scene to be used in that way. But yet it's kind of taken on a life of its own. So I think one of the ways you can think about creating those hybrid spaces is um, thinking about, okay, well, how do we also then create habitable spaces, spaces that different people can talk about and project their own ideas onto and their own meanings onto. So you can talk about, you know, um, things in, in, um, in different ways where these different views can be shared. So an example from clinical might be the use of a family tree. So a family tree is, from my point of view as a genetic counsellor, I'm documenting the relations, the biological relationships with people so we can understand either something like a risk assessment for a family history of cancer or an inheritance pattern in the case of prenatal or something like that. And from a patient's point of view, they're talking about their family story, the relationships they've had with the different people, the emotional relationships they've, they've got, the, you know, what that result means to them. And it's a, the, the family tree can be this kind of this so-called habitable space where we can both talk about distinctively different perspectives but we're also you know respecting each other's kind of point of view so I think um, one of the things I'm kind of looking at going forward is you know thinking about this kind of hybridity model well what can we use to create these habitable spaces where different contrasting views can coexist and and, and what can we use to kind of facilitate that. Brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm remembering having a conversation with a, a public engagement expert, this is going back quite a few years, who felt that it was really important to just use the scientific terms that, that we have, particularly within genomics. So if we use the words pathogenic variant more in everyday conversation, then people would yeah. learn what pathogenic variant means um, and therefore problem solved in understanding genomics. Could you say a little bit more about the way scientists use what are technically accurate terms to us, but how we can translate those and respect the response that you know public give to those terms. So I think, yeah, it's it's you know, this is something that we come up against a lot in genetics that has a huge amount of technical vocabulary. And there is this kind of tension between do you use the technical vocabulary so you can be kind of accurate, or do you use kind of more colloquial terms, but then you can, you know, there's a feeling that you might lose the precision of what you're trying to say. Um, I think it's, it's interesting that actually, um, you know, there's, there's you know, um, two things to say. I think the first is that um, to us, they're just scientific terms, but to the public, it goes back to what you know, is, is um, you know, um, uh, science is culture. Um, and it's a bit like, you know, to pick up on the opera example, um, it's a bit like going and saying, well, um, you know, um, we need to, you know, um, do opera in Latin, you know, opera in Italian first. You know, we can't, we can't, we can't translate it into English. They, you, you, you lose the magic of the opera. And if we're going to get people, they need to know. You know, it, it, it. You can see how actually, you know, it's, uh, you know, you, um, the, the culture itself um, can make people feel as if oh, this isn't something for me. So it's, it's perfectly fine to find other ways of, of communicating. And it's exactly the same with science. I think, you know, we absolutely want to engage people with the. You know the science itself but you know at the same time we need to understand how if you just use all these scientific terms that a lot of people you know may then feel as if you know that's um, very much a kind of point at which you're saying this isn't for you mm. um and i think it's interesting you know we talk about the accuracy of these words but of course you know scientific language changes all the time and you know only a few um you know uh years ago we were talking about the word mutation and you can't also divorce this I think was really important for science as culture you can't divorce science from the culture in which it stands um, you know so the word mutation used to be the incredible you know, the word that we thought was the most accurate you know the, what used to be used to call pathogenic variant we did call mutation but of course mutation had huge connotations from its use in broader culture and you can't divorce it from that so I think it's you know really important to find ways of using language that you know, is accessible to different different groups of people. Yeah, I mean, and amongst genetic counsellors, now the word mutations is, is really frowned upon, isn't it? It's it's really come out of the technical conversation because it has that mutant sort of yeah. connotation, doesn't it? So it's really frowned upon, yeah. Um, fascinating. So we've got a, just a couple more minutes. Um, so da, 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 da. Yeah, so I think we've covered the scientific terms. Um, have a little look. Yeah, could you say something a little bit about this? Is really tricky. 
uh, about social media. How can we use social media more effectively to connect with larger public audiences? It's uh, a good question. It's <laughs> really a hard one, isn't it? When you um, want to. Yeah. I'm, I don't I don't know is the short answer I mean I think um, I think social media is particularly challenging because um, it it does lend itself to I think a more kind of combative attitude um, and um, you know I think um, it's something where I think that you know it's a kind of watch this space I think it's something that um, needs research um, I think um, in terms of understanding how you take, I think, especially things like, you know, um, Twitter and um, which is, you know, very short um, and doesn't lend itself to extending, you know, sometimes if you see people having a civil conversation on Twitter when they disagree, it's like, you know, seeing a unicorn. I mean, it just uh, it's mm -hmm. so rare to happen. Um, and then I think on, on, you know, Facebook as well, I think you know, they've got a big problem with, um, you know, uh, what do you do with um, these um, sort of conspiracy theories that have been kind of popping up and how do you police those? Um, so I think it's a really valid question. I'm not sure I've got a simple answer as to say, I think, um, I think um, it represents a massive challenge. I mean, the flip side to that is that you, you um, can use social media to connect with people in a way that you never could before and particularly to connect with experts. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's a thing where, you know, um, I think if you are um, a scientific expert and you are connecting with on social media um, to um, think about, you know, how you do it is to understand that um, if you are going to challenge people on views that you consider unscientific, that, um, you know, a lot of the time, if you just try and simply um, correct where they're wrong, you know, you are you may well feel a bit better and that's absolutely fine but it's as a communication strategy it is ineffectual but i think there's work to be done on thinking well what's the evidence base for how um you know experts communicate with, with each other on social media um but and another a, thing that i know you're very passionate about and interested in is how experts communicate uncertainty um yeah. and how experts um don't always have a truth that they can give they can give a, a view on how evidence is gathered um, and can critique that but you know particularly with coronavirus there's been so many changes hasn't there and so much uncertain information that people are trying to make sense of it's very difficult to yeah. do that isn't it and i think that's where that kind of that view of science is just the you know just the objective truth and then i think you know sometimes you, you that can backfire because if you you know um go in with this idea that you know um i'm right you're wrong then that's really difficult when the science is still up for grabs and there's a huge amount of you know uncertainty surrounding the science then i think it does actually create a environment where cynicism can flourish because you know if you go in saying you know no you're, you're just wrong about this but then a few years later the data shows that actually you you know didn't understand it fully well people can either come back and go well you thought you were right about this and you weren't you thought you were right about this and you weren't and indeed climate change had this very problem where you know um it kind of opened the door for cynicism they, they you know a lot of the communication around climate change in the early days really tried to shut down this debate and say no look come on you know this is you know um um you know we, we've solved you know we, we know all about this now and actually you know when it turned out that of course man-made climate change is weird but it's real but the science is incredibly complex. There's huge amounts of uncertainties in terms of you know, what are the best policies, you know, um, what's actually going on in terms of kind of what the five year, 10 year, 50 year kind of prediction is going to be. And then all of the skeptics seized on that uncertainty as a way of proving that actually, the, you know, there was no difference between, you know, different point, you know, scientific points of view and their point of view. So I think, you know, if you are engaging on social media, that kind of, um, belittling of people who don't agree with you from the scientific point of view can really backfire. I think that's the danger and um, create this kind of environment of cynicism. Yeah, so I think I think the message for all of us is to be humble, isn't it? Yeah. And to have humility and to listen um, and to engage in debate and dialogue and uh, and create this, this third space where we can enable a, a shared understanding and co-create new meaning of the science together. Um, 
That's wonderful, John. Thank you so much. I think we're, at, we're out, out of time now. And if anybody wants to follow up um, this presentation and anything else that we're doing, the website is in the Q&A um, next to us. Okay, so thanks, everybody, and we'll see you another time.